Hi, this is uh, Jonathan Lamb. I hope you're doing well. This is pastor of uh, Middleburg and Rectortown United Methodist Churches, and it's so good to see you all. I know it's been a little while since I've done a video, and I apologize. It's It's been a busy season of my life. Uh, I meant to just take a short break for Thanksgiving, and um, some important ministry stuff happened, and uh, my grandmother passed away, so um, it's been a little bit since I've been able to sit down and do a video. Uh, but what I want to share with you is that we're going to continue with the um, series on Luke, and I will be putting out videos to the best of my ability um, through the end of the series. And we should be able to complete the remaining um, chapters of Luke sometime in early February, mid-February. Um, we only have 10 or 11 chapters left to go. So um, prepare yourselves for what's next. And let's have a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. And help us to celebrate your love and your mercy. We pray all of this in your holy in gracious name of God. Amen. Well, we're today on chapter 15, and I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke 15. And this week, we're actually going to be talking about three particular miracles. And e they each have the theme of something being lost or somewhat being lost. So the first one is actually entitled the parable of the lost sheep. This is verses one through seven. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he is joyful. He joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So it's interesting that Jesus begins this section by we're told a little bit of the context or a situation that's going on where Jesus is ministering and he's preaching to the people and he's specifically reaching out to tax collectors and sinners. This is pretty much everybody that's not part of the Sadducees party or a religious party there um, in Galilee in Israel and in, in Judea. And, and so the Pharisees are quick to judge him and say, hey, this man eats with sinners. And it's interesting because there was this understanding that if you associate it by eating with people like tax collectors and um, that had bad, bad reputations that um, it affected you. But what we see is Jesus is very intentional about having a ministry with people who are um, thought to be lost. And he wants them to have a relationship with him. And so Jesus tells us the story of this parable where we have a shepherd that's taking care of his flock and he's got 100 sheep. 99 sheep are exactly where they're supposed to be. And then he's got one little lost sheep who has wandered off by himself and is lost. And so what we're told is the shepherd has his sheep stay together and he just goes off and he goes in search of this one lost sheep. And he continues till he finds this little lost sheep and brings them back to the fold. And that's a beautiful image for you and me to remember that when we that if we stray that that Jesus is going to pursue us, that God is going to want us to have a relationship with him and to be part of the flock. Now 
our second parable in this particular section is entitled the parable of the lost coin. This is verses 8 through 10. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call her friends and neighbors together and say, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Here we have a story of a, of a parable about a woman who has 10 silver coins. This, this woman probably wasn't or didn't have a lot of money. In fact, the money that she had was probably just a day's wages. And this is all she had. And, and one of these coins just disappeared. So what does she do? She searches the entire house. She gets out her broom and sweeps every nook and cranny. She goes and, and looks through everything. And she keeps searching and searching until she found, found her coin. Then she let everybody know that she has found her lost coin. It's interesting, I think how Jesus notes again that the angels of heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents. Heaven celebrates every time somebody comes to know who God is, to know his love, his grace, his mercy. And whenever we, we can know people who give their lives to the Lord, that is something to celebrate. So each of us in our own journey, when we have given our lives to God, the angels in heaven, God's court celebrates with joy, seeing that there's another one who is here in God's kingdom with us. Amen? Yes. Um, now, these first two parables were particularly short. But then Jesus goes on to share a longer parable that is filled with lots of meaning, and that's the parable of the lost son. And this is verses 11 through 32. This makes up the rest of the chapter. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father! Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be, be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach so the pods that the pigs feed on. But no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got, uh, got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. 
But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. While he became near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out to plead with him. But he answered his father, look, all of these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the, the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. In his final section, we hear the story of the prodigal son, as is probably uh, most well known as the title for this particular story, but there is a number of, uh, of of characters here who stand out in our mind. The first is the father, the second is the younger son, and the third is the older brother. So first, let's let's think about the the youngest son. Okay, so the youngest son looks at his father, and he's like, "You know what, father?" I, I want my half of the inheritance. You have two sons, and I want my half like right now. The younger son really, and, and a lot of this understanding is based in an honor-shame culture where the purpose is to honor your elders, to honor um, those, uh, to gain, uh, give honor to those who deserve it, those who have authority, those who have power, and then um, the other side of honor shame culture is, of course, the shame. And the shame is like when you do something that isn't right, then you're shamed by your society. And this is um, an honor shame societies are I'm thinking of like the Middle East, particularly today and and other parts of the world um, still kind of operate within this understanding. And, and it's not really a understanding that the western world really works in any anymore to the magnitude um but anyway basically what the younger son says is i want my half of the inheritance and by saying that he's saying father i wish you were dead and that is a very shameful thing to say to your father well the father grants the younger son his wish. It's like you can have it. You can have your half of the inheritance. And the younger son immediately sails off everything. He sells off all of his land. He sells off everything uh, to accure or to gather up his wealth. And he goes off and he leaves and goes to a distant land, to a big city. And there he squanders every single penny he has on wild living. And then we're told the famine came to the land. It's not, I don't, famine just kind of appears. Don't know if it even, it would have happened no matter what. But um, he ends up in dire straits where he has nothing. And he doesn't know, the only thing he can do is hire himself out. And he is 
literally at the bottom of the barrel because this guy who this this Jewish younger man is forced to work with pigs, which the Jewish people would have seen as very unclean animals. And the very food that he feeds the pigs, um, which would not be appetizing under normal circumstances, um, starts to look really good to him because it's better than what food he has to eat. Because he literally doesn't have enough food or enough money to feed himself, even though he's working with, with these pigs. Finally, finally, this young guy starts to understand, like, hey, I'm I'm really suffering. I'm I'm really like starving here. I uh, and my my father's servants have life a lot better than I do right now. I mean, I could go back, ask for forgiveness. Um, I could ask for God for mercy from from my father. And my father could grant me mercy. Perhaps he could. Perhaps he would. Um, so that I could live on my father's estate as a servant and be taken back in that way. So at least I would have something to eat, somewhere to live, and have something. But as the young man made his long journey home, his father waited. His father waited on him. And when his father in the distance saw his son coming back, his father ran to him. Now, in this culture, an older man running would have also been seen as shameful because it, it wasn't he wasn't supposed to run. But here we have uh, the older man runs and he embraces his son and says, welcome home. But not only that, the father extends the rights of sonship to him, of his, the rights of what he had as a son, like a signet ring that had like the family crest on it. It gave him a robe that, um, to mark him as his son. The prodigal, the lost son, did not think that he deserved this. He says, you know, I sinned against you and against heaven. And and now, you know, he, the father, the father could have just let, let this son be a servant, but he didn't. He showed extravagant grace for the son. In fact, the word prodigal actually means like, like abounding grace. It's like lots of grace. And so this son receives a tremendous amount of grace as the father immediately says to his servants, he says, now go off. Go out and 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 get a fattened calf, and we're going to have a, a festival. We're going to have a feast to celebrate that my son has come home. Now, the older son was out in the field. The older son came back, and he heard all this music, and this older son's like, well, what's going on here? So the older son comes back to the uh to the house and he refuses to come in to see his father or to see younger brother now now this is a a shameful thing that the older father or older son does to the father and the father goes out and he pleads with him saying son please come in the older son says no you see i have done everything you ever asked me to i have served you for years i've done everything i'm supposed to and you never gave me anything you never gave me even a goat to celebrate with my friends 
and now that your your younger son who wished that you were dead um and spent half your, of all your money on wild living comes back and you you greet him of festival i have to admit uh the prodigal story uh, prodigal son story is one that i have often not related the most to I haven't felt like I was the prodigal. Maybe you are the prodigal. But I've related more to the older brother. Oftentimes. The older brother, though, missed something super important. And that is that he had been working for his father. But he had been working almost with the mindset of a servant. You see... The older son owned everything that was left and had the right at any time to have an animal. He didn't have to ask his father, but he lived in a state of expecting that or thinking that he didn't have access to this. And yet he absolutely did for everything that was left was his. I think sometimes we who've been in the church, maybe all of our lives, sometimes don't realize just how much grace there is for you and me. I think, in, in fact, I think that there are times in our lives, each of our lives, where we might relate more to one of these particular characters in the story. Perhaps you have been the prodigal. There have been times where I have been somewhat prodigal, but... Um, and then maybe there's times in your life where you feel like you're like a parent, like a father here, like you are, um, you you are thinking about your children, your grandchildren, and concern for them, or you might just be like the older brother, and and not realize just all that God had given you, and it's just right there at your fingertips, and it's there for you to enjoy. Well, the father goes on to share with the older brother that, you know, it's important for us to celebrate. It's important because you see your brother, your brother was dead to us and he's now back and he's alive. And so that's why we had to celebrate. He's, your, your brother was lost and now he's found. Well, my brothers and sisters, May we remember to celebrate those who are lost and have been found. May we celebrate when we encounter Christ as the prodigal. May we have grace and, and have hearts that are tender when we're an older brother. So that we would recognize all the grace that is at our fingertips. And may we continue to pray with grace like the older, like the father, who waited for his son to come home. May we have that kind of grace with one another and with our community, our friends, and our world. Well, thank you all for listening, and I look forward to sharing with you next week as we continue in following Jesus' teachings in chapter 16 and learning about the upcoming parables that Jesus wants to teach his disciples. We'll take care and God bless. Bye.